Why don't you believe in God? says the man shod in the suit at my door on a Sunday morn. His shirt is cotton poly, a bifabric weave made sinful by the same decree that outlawed homosexuality, but he seems comfortable enough in it, despite the sin it implies, as he batedly waits for my reply. There's only a few reasons guys wear ties on a Sabbath, and most of them are sad ones. But I'm not expecting estate agents, and I've made no late payments, so I'm guessing it's got to be God that he's selling, and actually, I don't have one. Why don't you believe in God? And as an opener, I feel that's a little odd. I mean, if you're going to bring something like that to the table, then you should be the one who's able to stand it up, surely. If you've got a theory about how the whole universe came to be, it's up to you to prove your point, not me to bring it down, standing in my dressing gown of a Sunday morning. But fair enough, that's the question he's asked, so let's play it. This is the clause he's raised, so let's go slaying. Why don't you believe in Santa Claus? And there's a pause while he wonders if I'm joking. And he doesn't say anything, so I figure I'll fill in. OK, I say. When I was a kid, Santa was great. Because when it got late on Christmas Eve, I'd leave out mince pies and I'd watch the skies. But when I got older, it was an excitement that kept me awake on Christmas night. And I didn't strain to hear the reindeer on the roof. I needed proof, because the presents and the sweets and the stockings and the songs were hiding the truth that something was profoundly wrong with my view of the world. If Santa was getting it all done in one night, he had to be travelling faster than light, and that would make him exceptionally heavy and stop time, which is fine. If he can do that, then well done, Mr. Claus, but why don't we see that technology in spaceships and cars and wars? And what about all those kids I hear about on Newsround, who work in sweatshops, making sweatshirts for Topshop? Does he visit them in their roadside shacks in Delhi to bring them a new telly or a Elvin knockoff of the same toy that they just made 500 of for spoiled Western boys like me? I don't see it. And when I do get my toy from his elves working for free, does that mean my parents aren't buying it from this kid's factory? So his family, already poor, has now got nothing to eat? Is that what Father Christmas is? A light speed sleigh and a way to ruin third world businesses? And, and those North Pole factories where the toys have their birth, if they're actually there, why aren't they on Google Earth? In fact, if he is such a kind old man, doesn't he understand that I can do without my plasticine and my tangerine and my plastic machine gun? If he could just load his sleigh with enough food for everyone, and then maybe on the way back he could take away some of the real guns. So I imagined reasons why he only worked the cold seasons, and he must have a network of clones, and gave away bigger gifts like phones to kids whose families were already rich. And the more I learnt about the world, the more complicated my justifications had to be, until suddenly it came to me. I didn't have to build these improbable edifices, these theses with toppling steeples to explain why he'd tolerate evil or let bad things happen to good people. I just had to see that I'd been tricked. It wasn't that there was some massive problem with the laws of physics. All those questions could just be fixed. I just had to throw out my Christmas list, because the old man with the long white beard just didn't exist. It wasn't that I'd lost my faith, or struggled to behave, or that something he'd done had got my back up. I just looked at the evidence, and I'm sorry, but it doesn't stack up. Because you owe it to your belief to test it hard against the best knowledge against which you can pit it. Bring your best arguments to your worst critic, and speak them as watertight and logical as you can get. With all your evidence, let them sing, and then, equally important, Listen to him bring his best too. And if you don't win, don't walk. Don't shout. Don't throw up your arms and claim the deafness of the devout. Don't repeat and repeat until your critic runs out of things to say and then walk away claiming victory. No, you owe it to your truth to change your mind. And the guy in the suit said, my truth and your truth may not be the same, but they're both equally valid. Well, that kind of truth is pallid. 
because there's another kind of truth, objective truth. Truth that doesn't care if you're aware of it. Truth that remains truth even if you don't understand the proof, because strangely, reality stays real no matter how you feel about it. If you fall off something high, then on the way down, you may wish with all your heart that you could fly. But whether your faith is great or none at all, only physics can dictate your rate of fall. Sometimes there's guys in suits queued up down the street. You'd think their beliefs were growing in power and size, but the statistics say otherwise. Attendance is falling and in census is half of those calling themselves faithful say they don't pray or even believe in the judgment day or, and this is odd, God. No, those in my front yard aren't the spearhead of a vanguard of a brave new way. No, those are the death throes of a way of thinking that's got sick. And the most merciful thing we can do now is make the end quick. So if you think I'm not worthy and you want to convert me, that's fine. I'll talk to you if I've got time, but you've got to put your faith up to be claimed if you want to change mine. I bet he didn't take. The stakes were too high. I could see him retreat behind his eye to a position of safety from which to berate me. This psalm proves my point, and he points. But if I pulled out a book, whether by Charles Darwin or Barbara Cartland, and I said to you, look, everything here I can prove, and the clue is the author's note on page 22 that says everything in here is definitely true, would that be good enough for you? He says, you're arrogant. And I'm thinking, really? When your church's first commandment is thou shalt have no other god than me? How many atheists threaten eternal inflagration for not sharing their take on creation? How many humanists can be found running around with a ceremonial scepter and crown? I'm not being arrogant with your foot in my door. I'm just not going to be ashamed anymore. But your way is so sad, says the man in the tie. If your life is pointless and then you die, as if it's my way, somehow I killed the creator. Anyway, I don't say that, I just file it for later and tackle what he really means. How can I be so full of beans in a world so spiritually poor? It's because atheists believe in more. See, I don't recognise the book that says we lost our place in glory. I read fossils imprinted in the rocks because it's a better story. I look back in history and say, wow, there was never a better time to be alive than now. We didn't fall from grace. The human race rose from it. And sure, no God means no one will clear up our mess. We have to guess how to do it ourselves and make up the ethical rules on our own because they were never written in stone. I can't sit on my throne and wait for the man to come and forgive my sins. I have to actually go and fix things. And to give you a flavour, when you stop waiting for a saviour, the responsibility can be crushing, send you rushing back to your fantasy, or you can wait and see if you have the bravery to stand up and savour the real world and start making it better. It's not perfect, but we'll get there. Why such confidence in the logical? The biological, not the theological? Why well, think I'm watching the dawning of a new sun on a new day? Well, I watched my son on the morning of Christmas Day when confident, smiling and unprompted by me, he said, I don't believe in Santa and the reasons are three. First, the presents under the tree. They're in the same wrapping as the ones in the stocking left for me. Second, I've got given some mittens, which although they fit, appear to be pulled from the same ball of wool as that sweater that Nana knits. And you want to hear number three? Well, we've got double glazed windows, a locked front door and no chimney. And I said, well, I've never seen Santa, but lots of people seem to believe he comes and sees us. It's a variation on the same answer I gave him about Jesus. But I was proud, because it took me years before I knew what was meant by what exists and what is true, and I knew this was progress, because my son made the deduction at the age of six. When will you?